Great to see you guys. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to um, chapter 32, Isaiah 32. And as you guys are finding your way there, let's pray and ask God to bless our time tonight in the Word of God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for a sweet time in worship. Lord, what a great time it was, Lord, just focusing on you and praising you and rejoicing in you. And Lord, just the sweetness of your spirit as you ministered to us, your people. And, and Lord, as we really ministered to you in song, uh, but Lord, you always reciprocate so beautifully. And I pray now that as we get into your word, Lord, and we read about you, and we look to you, Lord, and we see your heart written down for us, God, that you would now open up your word to us, that you would teach us. And Lord, let us um, learn not just what happened with the children of Israel uh, in their day, but God, prophetically, what is ap applicable to our day and Lord, what you would say to us tonight and to our nation, Lord, a nation that has fallen. Um, and yet, Lord, we are a people that honors you and loves you here. And you have your people all over this nation. And God, hear our prayers as we pray, Lord, that you would send revival to a nation that has fallen away. God, restore us. But Lord, again, speak to us and teach us from your word tonight. And we look forward to it and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, chapter 32, we go on with Isaiah prophesying about the future king they're about to have. Some believe because he's talking here about Hezekiah in this passage that maybe this is not chronological. It might be that Hezekiah, Isaiah wrote this at another portion and it was moved in the book to this place later on. It's all God's word, but it's possible this is not chronological because now we're going to see that uh, he's going to begin to speak about Hezekiah. Um, as a future thing, and it's possible that Hezekiah was also uh, in power at this very moment, or he was in power at this moment. In addition to that, though, it could just be simply speaking, uh, using what we call a dual prophecy or uh, far and near fulfillment. You guys have heard me talk about that, which is definitely here, and that is you'll see the prophet speak about what's going on right there at the moment for them, and then you'll see the prophet, you know, kind of give the future completion of the prophecy later on down the road. So a near and far, all wrapped in one. And again, we've talked about prophecy. So you understand the way that God writes prophecy. God is in the hot air balloon and we're on the ground in the parade. It's kind of the idea. So God looks down, he sees the front of the parade, the middle of the parade, the back of the parade. God can say, in 30 minutes, there's gonna be a, bl a band wearing blue uniforms coming through and you, you're on the ground. And so God sends someone, you know, a prophet to you and says, hey, there's going to be a, a band coming through here in 30 minutes. It's going to be wearing blue. Really? Yeah. God well, let me share that with you. Okay. And you start telling your friends around you and they say, there is not. So there's no, look around, there's a band playing, but no, they're going to be here in 30 minutes. So, you know, how do you know that? Well, because God told me he can see it from all angles, from the top, the middle, everything. He knows it all. That's what prophecy is like. So understand when you read prophecy, God is viewing everything at one time. And that's why as you talk about prophecy, try to get a chronological timeline here on the earth in your mind, because God will talk about what's in the middle of the parade sometimes first, and then he'll jump back to the front of the parade, and then he'll jump to the end of the parade and skip the middle. And so God's, you know, especially all over the place, like Revelation, he goes all over the place. But if you know the timeline, whenever God speaks of something, you know what he's talking about. So we're going to see him talking tonight about what's happening immediately there with the nation of Israel. Then we're going to see him jump into the millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign. Then we'll see him jump back to the second coming. And I'll point all these out to you when we get there. But I wanted you to understand why it's written the way that it is, because God sees it as it is. He is outside of time. He's not bound by time. Time was created by God for mankind. And then he put mankind in time and he's still outside of it, which again, um, I, I don't think it's really humorous to the Lord, but I find it humorous when people say that the Bible's outdated. Because when you understand there is no date to God's word that he's outside of time, there's no time where he is. You can't outdate something that has no time. And his word, the Bible says, is eternal, which means there's no way God's word could ever be outdated. Now, languages can be outdated. Um, cultures can be outdated, but God's word can never be outdated. We just have to read the eternal word and say, how does it apply right now to where we are inside of time in this whole picture? And so that's where we take up in 32. He says, behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule with justice. He's talking about Hezekiah in the immediate and the princes around him, but it'd be a godly kingdom with Hezekiah leading in godliness. This is during the days, remember when Sennacherib attacked and God destroyed 185,000 troops of Sennacherib with one angel. Um, you know, and it's interesting because you read about that angel. It doesn't say that it was Michael the archangel. It doesn't say that it was Gabriel. It doesn't say it was one of the big guns. It just says an angel. You know, it could have been Steve. Steve may have shown up, you know. 
and just taking that 185,000 just shows you the power of God. And so, so, but here he's talking about this is the time that it is and there's gonna be a king ruling in righteousness. Again, he could have been speaking poetically and prophetically, Hezekiah being in power now, or it could be chronologically out of order as some uh, scholars think. But either way, Hezekiah here, but he's also talking futuristically of Jesus Christ. And we'll see that as we go in the passage. The current Hezekiah, but then the current righteous king that's on the way, who's the true righteous king, and the princes that are with him. Who are the princes that will be with him when he comes back? Da, da, da. It's you and I. That's what the Bible says. So, you'll, yes, ladies, you'll be a prince. How that's going to work, I don't know. Um, you won't be princesses, because that's not how it's going to be. But either way, we'll see how that works when we get there. But uh, anyway, um, he says, a man will be as a hiding place from the wind. So you're going to see people. In other words, the princes around Hezekiah and the princes around Jesus will be blessings to the people. Okay? It'll be kind of like a, a hiding from the wind. Like when you, today, when you walk out in the sun, it's like melting you. You know, you walk in the shade. Remember how good that feels? You probably felt that today. You know, as I was out trying to find shade. That's what it's going to be like. It's going to be like, except it's not going to be hot during the millennial kingdom like that. The point is, you as a righteous person are going to be a refreshment to the people you're around. Even as Hezekiah's princes were a refreshment around uh, the people of that day, there'll be a cover from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place. That's a, that's a blessing. That's refreshing. As a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. So again, you see, he's talking about right then, and he's also talking about the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Christ. You have this dual prophecy going on. The, uh, how do we know that? Because now he specifically begins to speak about the millennial kingdom because notice everyone is healed. The eyes of those who see will not be dim and the ears of those who hear will listen. So ears will be opened, eyes will see. Also, the heart of the rash will understand knowledge. So everybody's gonna have knowledge of the Lord at that time and knowledge and wisdom and won't be foolish as we are now. And the tongue of the stammerers will be ready to speak plainly. So if you don't speak well, you will in the millennial kingdom. The foolish person will no longer be called generous, nor the miser said to be bountiful. And again, a lot of people have a lot of money today, and they spend it in very foolish ways. They, they give a lot of their money to very destructive causes. And yet the world will say, oh, what a, what a, what a bountiful person. You know, you're so generous. Thank you for this, you know, multi-million dollar gift to make America worse. We just thank you for that, right? And so they do, he said, that's not going to happen in the millennial kingdom. They won't, they, they, if somebody's foolish, they're going to be foolish. They won't, they, you, won't, you won't call a person who's foolish generous. You're going to say, that was foolish. Um, and there will be you know, mortals that enter into, people that don't have their new bodies yet. So there will be some that will be foolish during that time, from time to time. So it will be applicable uh, both now and in the millennial kingdom. But he says, they're not going to be called generous, nor the miser bountiful. You know, people today that, that hang on to their money and, and they're really tight-fisted and they get real rich, people look at them with admiration. Wow, you've really held on to your money. You're, you're super rich. And they said, not, not in the kingdom. It's going to be those who are generous, those who give, those who share, and those who give generously and abundantly. They're going to be the ones that are going to be exalted and blessed. So it's going to be the way God intended it to be. For the foolish person will speak foolishness and his heart will work iniquity to practice ungodliness, to utter error against the Lord and to keep the hungry unsatisfied and it'll cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. Again, probably speaking more in the, in the immediate here with Hezekiah. Also, the schemes of the schemer are evil. He devises wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words. Again, we see that today oftentimes in politics. Even when the needy speaks justice. So even if you speak what's right, they'll still do the wrong thing uh, because they're evil. But a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. Think about the, the wicked sit around and think about how they can be evil and how they can um, take money from people and do all the other kind of things. The generous person sits around and thinks, how can I bless somebody today? What can I do? What, what is a way that I can bless somebody today? That's how the righteous thinks. And, and I know we're not always thinking that every second, but you get my point. That's what it's going to be like in the millennial kingdom. You know, it's interesting. Um, you, you think about people that just do evil things to do evil things. Well, you know, you're not going to see that in the millennial kingdom. It's going to be thinking of well, how can I bless people? How can I be generous to people? How can I, you know, and you say, well, Mark, how can there be a difference even in the kingdom? And all that? Remember, when we get in the kingdom, there's going to be different levels of reward. Depending on how faithful we've been to the Lord, we're going to have different levels of reward, which means we will have different capacities to bless others. Some of you in here will have a greater capacity to bless others than I will, no doubt. And so when you see somebody maybe that doesn't yet have their new body, they're in the millennial kingdom, they're still living as a mortal, whatever. It talks about that. We can't get sidetracked tonight and all that, but we'll hit that in other places. There may be something that you just have that God gave you that's an eternal blessing. You're just going to show up one day and just blow their socks off. 
And they didn't earn that. They didn't get that blessing, you know, because they, they didn't, you know, they weren't as faithful as that person. But that person says, I still want you to have it. I just want to give it to you because I love you. And you're my brother. You're like, really? Yeah. See, that's what the kingdom's going to be like. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a weird thought. I heard somebody say years ago when I first got saved, you know, at the tables of heaven, nobody will have elbows. And my brain, that kind of gives this kind of bizarre looking creature or whatever, right? <laughs> But their point was, is we, we won't be able, it won't be about us. It won't be about what I can get. You know, it'll be, we'll be giving it, giving it to others. Everything will be handed here to you, giving you know, things to other people. The idea, I get the idea. I, I, I wish they'd have used a different analogy, and I wish I had it just then because I still get this kind of weird nightmare thing. But either way, um, so uh, that's what it's going to be like. It's gonna, you're not, you're not going to exalt those that are wicked. You're going to exalt those that do the right things and, um, and, and it'd be a blessing to others. And notice this, he says, for the foolish person will speak foolishly, his hard work iniquity to practice. Well, I'm sorry, we already did that. Uh, but the generous man, again, does generous things. We finish with verse eight, and by generosity, he shall stand. And then he shifts over in verse nine. Look at this. Rise up, you women who are, who are at ease and hear my voice. You complacent daughters, give ear to my speech. Now, we need some background here. The way that it typically works in a society and the way that it worked in Israel's society at this time is the men go downhill first, and then the women go downhill. That's just kind of historically how it's been. If you look at cultures, for example, men will go into sin quicker than, than women as far as pulling a culture down, uh, driven by all kinds of different things. You just see the men, they'll drop their leadership. They won't lead like they're supposed to. They won't do what they're supposed to. They kind of lay down basically and play dead. So then the women will rise up and try to fill that role because the men aren't doing it. You know, I hear people oftentimes say, you know, I went to this church and it's all women running it. There's no men doing anything. Well, that just shows you that it's a church that's out of order. Praise the Lord for the women. Don't get me wrong. Thankful for the women that are stepping up. It's almost like the mom in the home where the dad's a deadbeat. He never helps with anything. And she has to do everything for the family and the kids. Praise God for her. Because without her rising up to take care of the family, that family would be in big trouble. What God is saying is, dad, you need to get up and do your job. You're supposed to be leading. You're supposed to be helping. You're supposed to be doing all these things. But if you drop the ball, then yeah, mom's got to step up and do it. Well, the same thing happens in a culture. It happens in a family. It happens in a culture. The men drop the ball. And so you'll see the women step up. And you'll see as cultures begin to go downhill, you'll see more and more women in more and more prominent roles. Notice that. It's happening in America. Is there anything wrong with a woman being in a prominent role? No, I'm not saying that. This is not some kind of sexist statement. I'm saying when men quit leading... Women will step up and start leading. You'll see more and more women involved in Congress, Senate, running for office, doing all kinds of things. And, and praise the Lord for a lot of these women right now that are making a strong stand because we have so many weak men running our nation. They're afraid to step up and do what's right. They're afraid to speak boldly. So praise God for that. I'm not praising, you know, for, for being out of order. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying this is kind of the last ditch effort. That's what was happening here. Now, now the women have started going downhill. Now they're following the same pattern of the men. They're dropping the ball. They're not taking care of their families. They're not worried about what's happening. They're living for themselves. What can I do? What can I get me? How can I live? Make me happy. Give me pleasure. Do me, 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 me all the time. And God says, whoa, whoa, look. I'm already about to judge you guys because the men have just laid down and given up. And you women, you're the last hope. Listen, I think the moms of America are one of the last hopes we have. You, know, you see who was fighting in the school boards or what was being taught in the schools to the kids. I know there were some men there, don't get me wrong, but who predominantly was it? If you watched any of those videos, who was there? Moms. Matter of fact, what were they called? They had names. Like, you know, the mom bull or even different names. I don't know what they're calling. I'm talking about the right word, but what was it called? Mama bear. Mama bear. Thank you. Yeah, mama bull doesn't work. <laughs> but why, you know, they didn't, you know, they didn't say daddy bear. They didn't say daddy bear. Because a lot of us daddies have gone to sleep. And God is saying, Dad, you got to wake up. It's time to wake up. And, and moms don't go to sleep. Keep on being a mama bear. Because that's the hope. But the women start going down. And so now God cries out to them. Well, look, ladies, now you're going down. What are you doing? You're getting complacent. You're as bad as the men now. Now you're living just for yourself like they were. And the nation's about to be judged. If somebody doesn't get their act together and repent, you're done. And when a nation goes so far and nobody repents and the church doesn't even repent, then the nation is done. It goes under. It's just the collapse of a nation. But now he begins to rebuke the women here because of this. But I had to give you some background. He says, you complacent daughters, give ear to my speech. In a year and some days, you'll be troubled, you complacent women. For the vintage will fail. You like your little wine parties. I'm not going to have wine anymore. I'm going to shut the vintage off. Tea parties are over. 
No nice little lunches. It's done because you become complacent. And so he says, the vintage will fail. The gatherings will not come. Tremble, you women who are, who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent ones. Strip yourselves and make yourselves bare and gird yourself with sackcloth. In other words, repent. Just like you would tell the men. It's time to repent. Listen, God has been really, I think, putting on my heart. And I hear that. I know pastors always say this, and I've said it before, and God does it on a regular basis, probably because of the position I'm in. But he'll speak to me about repenting, and then he speaks to me about the need for the church to repent, and then the need for the nation to repent. Our nation needs to repent desperately, but we have to lead the way. Dads in here, we're the first ones responsible to start repenting. The Bible falls on, the responsibility falls on the men first. That's God's authority structure. It has nothing to do with one being better than the other. It is God's authority structure. Even Jesus, when he walked on the earth, came under the Father, and he said, I only do those things that the Father tells me to do. And I'm not saying the women are only supposed to do what their husbands tell them to do. Don't take me wrong on that. I'm saying he walked in an authority structure, and we have to walk in an authority structure as well. So God says, first, the men repent individually. Then the women need to repent. Then the church needs to repent. Then a nation can see the light of God and the nation can repent. Guys, just again, and we'll, talk, we'll touch on it maybe some on Sunday, but look how far we've fallen as a nation. Listen, we can't expect the world to not, the world's going to sin. They're the world. They don't know Christ, they're gonna sin. But the church has got to understand right and wrong based on God's word. And then we've got to make a stand within the church that the church doesn't get defiled. The problem is, is that the world begins to come into the church and the church becomes just like the world. We're supposed to be holy for God and then we affect the world around us. Okay, we have to make sure we know, you know, what, what is right, what is wrong. And, 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 and then we make that stand on what is right and what is wrong. I mean, we've gotten so mixed up and messed up in the world out there. Again, we seem even taking our children and leading them down horrible paths and all these things that are happening. That's gonna happen because that's the world and that's a result of a nation falling away from God. So we can attack the world all we want, but that's not the answer. We can talk about what great sinners the world is. We've gotta get our act together. Are we walking with God? Are we spending time in prayer? Are we spending time in the word? Are we being a witness? Are we sharing? Are we praying for our nation? Are we praying for our church? Are we praying for each other? And then as we begin to shine for the Lord, then God can begin to affect the world around us. Why are you guys different? Here's why, Jesus Christ, and he loves you. And we need to know what right and wrong is because if we don't know what God says, for example, about male and female, how are we gonna, when they come and ask, how are we gonna minister to them? It's how we're gonna how we're gonna minister to each other. Listen, this is coming into the church. If the church comes just like the world, then we're all doomed. We're, we're, we are the salt of the world. We're the light of the world. If the light goes out, it's just all darkness everywhere. If the salt is gone, we're no good for anything but to be trampled underfoot by men. We're gone. So we have to know where we stand and why we stand there. We have to know that the Bible says that men are not supposed to dress up like women and women are not supposed to dress up like men. And we need to know where that is in the Bible. Not so that we can run to the world and attack them and tell them how evil they are. They're the world. They don't know Christ, okay? You don't conquer darkness by beating it. You conquer darkness by turning on the light. And our job is simply to go, click. The Bible says that's wrong. And we as a body have to know that. So when we run into people, we don't attack them. But when we see them, we can love them. How many of us in this room, if we came upon a man dressed as a woman, would love them? And how many of us would get mad? Oh, get me around, be around. How many? Listen, we've got to love. Who's going to love them? Who's going to tell them of God's love? Well, the Bible doesn't say this is wrong. It does. Where? Well, let me show you. But you need to know where. Okay, that's what keeps the church pure. That's the light that shines into the world. And it's not from an attack standpoint. It's not from being ugly to the world. It's loving them. It's giving them hope. Remember, if, if we don't tell them who's going to, the world's not gonna tell each other, hey, I think maybe this is wrong. What do you think? I don't know. I think, should we, should we, should we do all this and maybe raise up the next generation that way? You think that's wrong? Nah, there's nothing wrong with that. Because they don't know the Bible. And if they did know the Bible, would they still believe that it's wrong? Probably not, because they don't know Christ. You know God's word. You know the Lord. You can let them know God loves you, but he tells us what's right and what's wrong, and somebody's got to be bold enough to say it, or we're all doomed. And I do believe we're already under the, I believe the judgment of God has begun in America. I believe it's already underway. And that's a whole other study again that maybe I'm getting off into now, didn't mean to, but I'll try to pull back in here. But the reality is, we're on that path to judgment from God. I know you hear pastors say that, yeah, yeah, we had not been no. When you read what God says he'll do to a nation, guys, just today I was reading, one-fourth 
of South America has now come to America from the, through the southern border. One fourth. And the other 50% said they plan on coming soon. Now you go, we're literally being turned into a whole nother nation by other nations coming in and we're letting it happen. And you can get mad and go, we need to vote this guy out and vote that guy in, and I'm gonna go down there and we're gonna get binoculars and chase him around or whatever. Okay, fine. But that's not gonna solve it. You know what the problem is? God says, when I begin to judge a nation because they've been unfaithful to me on the land that I've given them, I'm gonna move them out and bring somebody else in. God says, I'm taking you out of the land. I'll bring in a whole new people. He says, I'm gonna do They did it. Why do you think that God sent the Jews into Canaan? It wasn't because God just said, I just decided I like Jews better and I'm gonna kick Canaanites out. No, Canaanites, he warned them, the Bible tells us, for 400 years. If you don't repent, I'm gonna take you out, put a, new, a whole new group of people in, into Israel. We don't care what you're saying. We're not gonna listen to you prophets. We're not listening. We're not listening. Right? And so God kicked them out and God brought Israel in. And people say, how could a God do that? God says, I will do that. If, he says, it's my land and if you defile it, I'm giving it to somebody else. That's underway. You know why our southern border is being overrun? Okay, we can all talk about the leadership. We can all do that, okay? There's a, there's a political argument to be made, but that's not my argument. It's because God's letting it happen. I believe with all my heart, based on the word of God, again, we may cover some of it on Sunday, I believe with all my heart, God said, you turn away from me as a people. He said, if you love me as a people, I'll give you a land and I'll bless your land. Our founding fathers came in loving Jesus and he gave us the greatest land in the world. He said, but if you turn from me, I'm giving it to somebody else. You're gonna go down. So the answer is not building walls on the southern border, although there's nothing wrong in that. I'm not getting political. We, we, we put locks on the doors of our house, don't we? Well, there's nothing wrong in building a wall on the southern border, okay? It's not a political statement, it's just wisdom. But, but it has nothing to do with keeping people out or keeping people in or who can come in. That's not, it's not kind of some kind of judgment that way. I'm simply saying the bottom line is, is God says, I'm gonna open up your borders. I'll tear down your walls. You can vote anybody in you want. It won't work because I'm judging you. I'm gonna give your land over to a brand new people. It's happening. It's happening. Three million a year now, they say, are coming into America from other countries. And we're, we're being overrun rapidly. And again, we can jump up and down and talk about politics. That's not the answer, guys. Repentance. We need to repent as a church. We need to repent as a nation. And then once we've repented, if we do repent and God restores our nation, if it's not too late for God to do that, then everybody that's here, we can all just love God together. Praise the Lord. And then we can set up new boundaries and decide our, what are the capacities of our nation and put laws back in place, et cetera. Now, I don't know what the future of our nation is gonna be, but I can tell you from the Bible, when I saw the, the, the border stuff happening, I knew what was going on. I knew immediately. I said, what, what's changed? Why is, it just, why is this going on so rapidly? It's the judgment of God. Deuteronomy. Anyway. I really want to finish four chapters. Maybe we still will. But he says, you know, strip yourselves, make yourselves bare, gird sackcloth on your waist. Verse 12, people shall mourn upon their breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine uh, uh, on the land of my people will come up thorns and briars. Yes, on all the happy homes in joyous city. The women were going, oh, we have happy homes. Our home's great. We have a joyous city. We live in Jerusalem. We've got our little tea parties and our wine glasses. And who cares about what, you know, that everybody's living in sin. We don't care. The guys don't care. So we don't care either. And we're all gonna do it together. He goes, I'm putting an end to that. That's gonna stop. Because the palaces will be forsaken. The bustling city will be deserted. The forts and towers will become lairs forever. A, a, a joy, now he shifts again, a joy of wild donkeys and pastures of flocks. Notice that you're gonna be a desolate land until, verse 15, the spirit is poured out from up on high and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field and the fruitful field is counted as a forest. He goes, I'm gonna make the area of Jerusalem and all is gonna be way lesser than it is now until you guys acknowledge me in the last days and I pour my spirit out. Now, again, yes, there's joy in Jerusalem today. Yes, they still have things going on, et cetera. But it's not like it was and it's not gonna be like it was until the Lord comes back and pours his spirit out again. I mean, it used to be a forested land all around there. It was beautiful. Now it's you know, mostly desert around. They're replanting trees and all, but he's saying, this is my judgment I'm bringing. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness. Now he goes back. Remember we talked about jumping back and forth. Now he goes to the millennial kingdom. He says, then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. This is during this thousand year reign. The work of righteousness will be peace. So there'll be peace worldwide because we're living in righteousness. And notice that's the result of righteousness for a nation. Peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. 
Those of you that are my age or older, you can remember when we could leave our doors unlocked, even at night, sleeping in our home. You can remember when we could ride around our neighborhoods on our bikes late at night all over town and there was never a danger. Can you imagine that today? You tell that to the generation, oh, could never, that would never be. It, it's gotten so bad that nobody even imagines letting your child be gone you know, for a few hours in the dark, riding around, just go ride around Knoxville, go have fun, honey, come back whenever. What? That's what it was like. That's what it was like just 60 years ago. Now imagine that. Why? Because we were still a nation that was honoring God. Again, the argument is America has all its sins. Yes, America has its sins. I have mine. But it's, it's, the sin is never going to be gone until Jesus Christ comes back. America was honoring God in its sin. Do you follow me? We weren't perfect, but we were honoring God. We need to honor God again. And we're never going to be perfect. And no nation is going to be perfect. And none of us in here are going to be perfect. I'm not making an excuse for sin. I'm saying when you live for God in your imperfection, there'll be quietness and there'll be assurance and you'll rest and not live in fear. You don't have to worry about filling up your, your car you know, at, at the gas pump and somebody may come up and jump you. Think about it. We live in a day and age where somebody can walk up and attack you at the gas pump. You know? And I would say if that happens, grab the hose and spray them, but it's too expensive. I would say, <laughs> throw down the hose and wrestle them to the ground and save $100. Verse 18, my people will dwell in a peaceful habitation in secure dwellings and in quiet resting places, though hell comes down on the forest and city is brought low in humiliation. That was God will protect them, no matter even if bad things happen, if they honor me. Blessed are you who sow beside the waters and send out freely the feet of the ox and the donkey. Again, blessed are those who are generous. You know, those who are sowing freely or you're giving out, you know, helping others. You send out freely the feet of the oxen and the donkey. Let them use your, you know, whatever. It might be, you know, your, your vehicles or whatever, you know, and you're, you're, you're sowing beside the waters. You're helping them with their gas bill or whatever. The idea is you're, you're using your resources to bless others. Chapter 33, he goes on. He says, woe to you who plunder, though you've not been plundered. He's speaking now of the evil people in the last days. And you who deal treacherously, though you've not dealt, though they have not dealt treacherously with you. When you cease plundering, you'll be plundered. So God's going to judge you, in other words, for what you're doing. When you make an end of dealing treacherously, they will deal treacherously with you. Oh, Lord, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Be their arm every morning, our salvation, also in time of trouble. So they're doing that. But Lord, watch over us. At the noise of the tumult, the people shall flee. When you lift yourself up, the nation shall be scattered. In other words, the world's going to be doing what it's doing right now. But God, when you show up in power, everybody's going to freak out. The Bible says in Revelation, when the Lord comes back, people are going to be running in caves trying to hide from, from, from the wrath of the Lamb. And I love, you know, uh, I believe it was Damian Kyle I heard him say one time, he said, what, what exactly do you have to do to get a lamb angry enough to have wrath? You know? He said, but they're going to be running from the wrath of the Lamb. They'll be scattered. And your plunder shall be gathered like the gathering of a caterpillar as the running to and fro of locusts, he shall run upon them. So the Lord will just, he's going to wipe them out. Even as these you know, locusts, these swarms of locusts that come in or the caterpillar that eats all the green leaves. The Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion, which is the city of David or modern day Jerusalem would kind of sum it up. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. And when will that be? When he's seated on his throne. It's going to be filled with justice and righteousness. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your time. So it will be stable. Why? Because we'll have wisdom and knowledge during those thousand years. And the strength of salvation, the fear of the Lord is his treasure. Is the fear of the Lord your treasure? It's, it's a treasure to have a fear of God. The fear of God is so wonderful. The Bible says the fear of God is clean. It's pure. It's holy. Because it's a different kind of fear. It's not a fear like a cowering fear. It's a respect and it's an honor. And I'll tell you what it does. If you really fear the Lord and you know him, you, it keeps you from sin. Because you recognize, you know, I don't want to do that because I've got to stand before dad. And he loves me and he's going to forgive me, but I really don't want to have to do that. You know, I mean, the Lord speaks to me very gently. But there have been times when I've been doing things I shouldn't be doing and I've heard a firmer voice. I've shared that with you guys. That's a scary thing. You know, it's, it's kind of like, hey, you know, I remember, um, uh, I don't, I would never do it again, but when I first got saved, I was watching these kids and, and I'd never watched over kids or whatever. And I saw some little kids spitting in the other kids' shoes. <laughs> it's just kids. They do that kind of stuff. I know it now. I mean, I was just, and I kind of went, hey, you know what I mean? And I was like, stop. You know, but, I, but I said it kind of loud and I'm a man, a little kid. He just stopped and started, Whoa! 
I mean, he started melting and trembling. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've killed him, you know? <laughs> and so again, I realized I learned a lesson, you know, you gotta be careful with that, but you realize when you're that much bigger and stronger and, and louder and, and, and all these other things than somebody else, just the voice can scare you. And all God has to do is kind of go, oh. And I'm like, yes, sir. I hear him and I respect him. That's a healthy fear. We need to have that fear. Do you fear God tonight? Do you fear the sin you're thinking about doing when church is over? I don't, some people do. Do you fear God? When you get alone and nobody's around, do you, does it bother you thinking, God knows this, he's watching me and I've got to answer to it one day? That's a healthy fear. It's a good thing. It's not bad. And so, um, you know, we need to have that fear. It's, he's going to, again, the fear of the Lord, it's, it's a treasure. Surely the valiant ones shall cry outside. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. The highways lay waste. The traveling man ceases. He has broken the covenant. He's despised the cities. He regards no man. The earth mourns and languishes. This is again of the judgment of God before he comes back. We talk about the great tribulation. Lebanon is shamed and shriveled. Sharon, or the fields of Sharon or Sharon, is like a wilderness. That's in the, the, the southern part of Israel. And Bashan and Carmel, that's up there in the northern part of, part of Israel, they shake off their fruits. In other words, it's a great place of fruit, but it won't be then. And notice after the great tribulation, because that's the reference here he's referring, he says, now I will rise, says the Lord. Wow, this is awesome. He said, I'm gonna come up. It's, it's time now. God's waiting, but he's gonna come back and just rock the earth. He's gonna say, all right, I've seen enough of this. I've put up with enough. I've been very gracious. I've waited, I've waited, I've waited. I've sent messengers to you and you've gotten mad at them. You've called them haters. You've attacked them. You've abused them. You've rejected my word. Now I'm gonna judge you. And here it comes. And he says, I will rise, says the Lord. I will be exalted. Now I will lift myself up. You shall conceive chaff. That is the bad stuff of the wheat. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. So you're going to destroy yourself when I come back. And the people shall be like the burnings of lime, like the thorns cut. They shall be burned in the fire. Remember when the Lord comes back, the Bible says he will be like a consuming fire. And everything that we do that's not of God is going to be burned up. Everything that we, whatever we're doing that's not of the Lord, even if we're making it look like it's of the Lord, whatever, it's going to be burned up. You know, one of the things I tell the staff and one of the things I pray on a regular basis is, look, we're too far down the road here in the ministry and, and too, you know, too far down the road, even in age and too close to the Lord coming back. We don't need to be wasting time on projects God's not in. If God doesn't want to build a new sanctuary, I don't want to build it. You follow me? I don't want to build it if God doesn't want to. What is that? A lot of effort, a lot of sweat, a lot of time, a lot of money. I don't want to do that. But when I see what God's doing, I say, all right, Lord, I'm going to step forward. It looks like we need that. And if, we do, if God wants to do it, he'll bring the money in. God's going to do it. He always, he's always done that. But it's got to be God doing it, right? Or whatever the ministry is. Are we going to get involved in that ministry or this ministry? If it's just something that looks good or is expending energy or whatever the case might be, we need to really be lean. We need to focus in. There are lots of needs out there. And we need to be ready to meet any need God puts in our heart. But you individually and us as a church, we'll say, God, what do you want us to do? There's no way we can give to every mission group in the world. Can't afford that. We can't do that. But there's some mission groups he wants us to give to. So our prayer has to be, God, where's the money go? Where do we put it? How do we spend it? You show us. We've got to follow you. There's no time to waste is the point. And so, again, he's, God's going to, again, you know, rise and, 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 you know, Take care of all this when he comes back. Burn everything up like the burnings of lime. Here you are afar off, what I, what I have done. And you who are near, acknowledge my might. And notice when he does this, what's gonna happen? The sinners in Zion are afraid. That is, as they see the Lord come back, or during that time when they realize he's coming back and they're gonna face him, they're gonna be afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. People that are openly living in sin and being hypocritical today, they're not really that afraid of God or they wouldn't be doing that. But when you suddenly realize, oh my goodness, this is real and here he comes, there's going to be real fear. And there's going to be a real, oh my goodness moment. Sometimes I think about, look at this world today and what we're doing. And I think about if the Lord came back right now, you know, not good. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? That is when the Lord does come back and that devouring fire comes, who among us here, who's going to be holy? Who's going to dwell with God? Who's going to get into the kingdom unscathed, if you will? He's going to tell us. Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burning? So God, the everlasting fire of God, the purifying God of fire when he comes back, who's gonna make it through? Now, if you know Jesus, you're gonna make it through. I'm gonna tell you that right now. If you know the Lord, you're not gonna be burned up. You're gonna be in the kingdom of God. What he's talking about here is, who's gonna make it through with anything left? You know, 
I used to say when I first got saved, I'd just be glad to get in. I'm just glad to get in. And I am. Don't get me wrong. I'm just glad to get in. I appreciate that. I'm unbelievably appreciative. But the more I walk with the Lord and the more I read his word, God's desire for us is not just to get in, but to get in with joy and reward. He wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to be productive while we're here. And he wants to be able to give us, he doesn't want everybody just to get there. And we come in, you know, crawling, you know, on our hands and knees and panting. And, you know, we made it, we made it. You know, we're kind of hugging each other. We got in, we got in, you know. He wants us to go in. And and not only when the fire hits us, yeah, there's going to be some stuff we did. Mark, that wasn't me. Ah, there it went. Okay. I spent a lot of energy and money on that. Here's a, oh my goodness, that one too? Yeah, that one. This one, yes, this one was of me. Ooh, and it solidifies. No, oh, there's reward. Oh, this is great. And then it's all done. He goes, now there's your reward for eternity. That's yours. That's what's of me. That's what's left. I want to have something. It's not because of greed or jealousy or envy. There won't be any of that in the kingdom. But if nothing else, just to say, Lord, I tried to serve you. I tried to do something that was of you. I wanted to be, you know, a son that you'd be pleased with. And we need to have that attitude, you know. Don't don't be afraid to to, to seek out reward. There's nothing wrong in it. If there's fleshly reasons, well, there's fleshly reasons. But if there's not, he's saying, look, who's going to make it through here? Um, He says, here's the one, verse 15. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes. Notice this. It's going to show a picture of not just turning from sin, but aggressively. You know, um, I don't know. Let me make something up. Um, I'd like to really uh, kind of give you all the money you need to build. You know, you mentioned a new sanctuary. Here's $10 million building a sanctuary. However, I'd really like a whole different direction for the church. I'd like you to teach some things differently. That's a check I'd never take. Keep your money. Keep your money. God doesn't, God doesn't need money. God needs hearts, and we need to be faithful to God. And so, in the sense, you think about the political realm. How many people take bribes? They like, you know, I'd like to make a donation of, you know, a million dollars to your campaign. And by the way, there are some things I'd like to see happen in my district. Well, I'll see what I can do about that, you know. He says, no. He says, the kind of person that's going to be in the kingdom with reward, the kind I'm looking at, they're going to be the kind that say, are you kidding me? Get away from me. No way. I have no time for that. I don't operate that way. I'm going to do what the right thing is. I've been sent here by my constituents. I'm going to do what they sent me here to do, not try to get money out of this or gain some whatever or in the church setting. I've been here. I'm here to serve the Lord. I'm here to do what God's told me to do, not what you tell me to do or what the world says to do. You can no longer preach that. I'm sorry, we're going to. Not out of rebellion, just to be rebellious, but we're going to obey our commander. We're going to obey our Lord. And again, throughout history, that gets people in trouble, but it is what it is. He says, that's the kind of person that's going to have reward in the kingdom. He gestures with his hands. No, I don't want your money for your purposes. Who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed. You know, yeah, we want to, you know, we're going to do some things to maybe, uh, some people may die when we do this, but it's going to be great for us politically or whatever the case might be. We'll make piles of money or whatever. He says, no, don't even, don't even entertain that. Shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high. His place, will, uh, his place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him and his water will be sure. So I'll bless that man or that woman that does that. The eyes will see the king in his beauty, or your eyes rather. So we're going to see the Lord come back in the millennial kingdom. We'll see him in his beauty. You will see the land that is very far off. Your heart will meditate on, on terror. Where is the scribe? Who is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? You'll not see a fierce people, a people of obscure speech beyond perception, of stammering tongue that you cannot understand. It was the, the, they're going to be gone. The terrorists will be gone. Those who do these horrible things are not going to be around anymore. You know? Look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feasts. Now, again, it was their appointed feasts during their day, but there's also going to be, the Bible says, during the thousand-year reign, appointed feasts for us. In a minute, we're going to talk about the highway of holiness, that we're going to go up there. We're going to be singing and celebrating on going up to feast every year to feast with the Lord. Is that going to be amazing or what? I just, again, if you, if you go long enough in your mind and imagine that, you're going to see how amazing that is. Just have fun with that one. We'll talk about more of that in just a moment. But he says, um, we go up, look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feast. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet home. Isn't a quiet home a great thing? It means where there's peace. There's joy, you know, not tension, not strife. If there's any place I want to have peace, I want it to be my house. I know you guys feel the same way. You know, you can have, you got enough stress at work. You got enough stress in the world. You need a place you can go to where there's peace. And so that's something as husbands and wives, we, we need to try to work on for each other. Husbands to make that a place of peace for our wife. 
to pray for God to help us to do that. Wives, to pray. Help me to make this a place of peace for my husband. And I understand marriages and different tensions and hard times. I get all that. That's a battle that goes on. But in general, a quiet home, a tabernacle that will not be taken down, no one of its stakes will ever be removed. So when God comes back and establishes it, it's done forever. Nor will any of its cords be broken, but there will be a majestic Lord. Uh, but there, the majestic Lord will be for us. A place of broad rivers and streams. I love this. The Bible says when he establishes his kingdom, that out of the southern side of the Temple Mount, there's going to be a fresh water stream that's going to just come roaring out of there. And there's going to be this river that comes down through Jerusalem, down between the Mount of Olives, because it's going to split apart due to a great earthquake the world's going to bring. It's going to go down, touch the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea will spring to life and be a major fishing port during the thousand-year reign. And then the water's going to go the other way down to the Mediterranean. And remember all the destruction that Revelation talks about that the oceans of the earth will be going through during the Great Tribulation. Turned to blood, destroyed by all these things. It's going to touch the water of the oceans at the Mediterranean and heal the oceans of the entire world. And so all the waters will be refreshed and sparkling. It's going to be beautiful. There's going to be this gorgeous sparkling river that's going to be pretty deep running through Jerusalem. You know, it gets up to Ezekiel's neck and he stops and goes, I can't go any farther, you know, in, in the vision that he has and all this. And notice what it says about it. It'll be there sparkling from the glory of the Lord, no doubt. Can't even imagine its beauty. But no, it says, in which no galley or oars will sail. So no boats will be in the water. You can't, you can't kayak down the, the rapids there in Jerusalem. Sorry. Um, but you won't want to. It's going to be a place of just joy and peace. You're not going to see giant boats out there and all this stuff. Um, nor majestic ships will pass by. For the, at this time, look at this. For the Lord's our judge, the Lord's our lawgiver, and the Lord's our king. He will save us. He's our government now. Won't that be a great day? When the Lord's our government? By the way, those of you that are American history buffs, this is where we got our three branches of government. Our founding fathers wrote in the documents that the way they came up with our three branches of government is Isaiah 33, 22. And that is, the Lord is our judge, the Supreme Court. The Lord is our lawgiver, the Congress and Senate. And the Lord is our king, the President of the United States. So they followed the authority pattern that God gave in Scripture of what his kingdom will be like. And that's probably one of the reasons we've been so successful in world history. He says, your tackle is loose. You could not strengthen their mast. They could not spread the sail. Then the prey, that so the ships can't be there, in other words. Then the prey of great plunders divided. The lame take prey, and the inhabitant will, will not say, I'm sick. The people who dwell there um, in it will be forgiven of their iniquity. So nobody will be sick during the millennial kingdom. Again, that's going to be great. Uh, no COVID or anything else. Uh, chapter 34, come near you nations to hear and heed you people. And we may not finish 34, so but let's get started in it. Come here, you nations to hear and heed you people. Let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all things that come forth from it. For the indignation of the Lord is against all nations. Now, now we're looking at the second coming. Remember we talked about uh, currently millennial kingdom. Now he's jumping back to the second coming. For the indignation of the Lord is against all nations. His fury is against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He's given them over to the slaughter and their slain shall be thrown out. Their stench shall rise from their corpses and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. Now again, this is at the very, very end. So we talk about the second coming, but this now again, uh, there, there may be a dual prophecy. God may do something like this to some degree at the second coming, but then at the very end of the thousand year kingdom, literally he's gonna destroy the, the whole heavens and, and, and all that's around us and build a new one. So I think we see kind of a near millennial second coming and then last, you know, eternal kingdom all wrapped up in one here. He talks about the last kingdom. The heavens will be rolled up like the scroll. Their host shall fall down. That is, uh, the, 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 again, the angels that are being judged and the angels and, and the stars, I believe, are referenced to as well. As the leaf falls from the vine and as a fruit falling from a fig tree. So all these things collapsing down as God destroys this current universe to build a new one. And again, uh, but an immediate reference here to the second coming. So there's going to be something dramatic like this that happens second coming. Meteorites, whatever it's going to be, we don't know. Ultimately, it will all be wiped out. So I think it's both kind of wrapped into this. But he's still in reference to the second coming because at the second coming, remember where he's going to go first before he comes back to Jerusalem and judges there. At the Battle of Armageddon, the very first place the Lord goes is down to Petra. It's down in Edom. We've talked about that. Now he talks about that. Verse 5. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. He's talking about with blood. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom. And on the people of my curse for judgment, the sword of the Lord will be filled with blood. Remember, he's going to go there first and judge them. The Bible says he'll get blood on his robes. 
And that's why when, he, when we see him coming back in Revelation and the, the armies of God coming with him there to Jerusalem, it says he'll have blood on his robes. How the world could he already have blood on his robes and he hadn't even fought the battle at Jerusalem yet? Because this is the blood of Petra. This is the blood of the Antichrist armies that are trying to destroy the Jews that have fled to Petra those final three and a half years. It says it's filled with blood. It's made overflowing with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the, kidney of, uh, with the fat of kidneys and rams. Again, probably not literal lambs and goats and kidneys and rams, although there could be some of that mingled in because of their flocks. But the Jews would have understood the symbolism the Lord was using because when they sacrificed all the animals on the Temple Mount and there were major sacrifices, there was blood everywhere and kidneys and fat of animals all over the place. He's saying, that's what it's gonna be like in Edom. That's what it's going to be like in Petra when I go and do my sacrifice. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. Basra is another name for Petra. And in a great, a great slaughter in the land of Edom. The wild oxen shall come down with them. The young bulls with the mighty bulls. Their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust saturated with fatness. Remember we talked about it says there'll be blood up to the horse's bridle. That's four feet deep. Some believe it will literally be four feet deep in some places. That may be accurate. But also there was an ancient battle saying in that day that when the horses would ride through all the blood of the battlefield, it would splash up all the way up to their bridles. And so they called it blood up to the horse's bridle. So is it just being splashed up from what's going on or was it literally four feet? We'll find out during that time. Some say, how could that be? In certain valleys, you could have four feet of blood. According to historians, when Rome came in and destroyed Jerusalem, the, the streets are all, those of you that have been there, you've seen them, it's all concrete. The, the, the side, there was so much blood from all the people they were killing that it was going into people's homes and putting their winter fires out. Think about that. So, I mean, blood, when there's no place for it to go, it can get deep really fast. I know that's gross. And so thank you for that uplifting point there, Mark. That's just bonus points. You can have that. Do with that as you will. I'm going to forget it. That's what I'm going to do. But either way, um, so uh, he says, for this is the day of the Lord's vengeance, verse 8, the year of recompense. Why? For the cause of Zion. Look how everybody treats Israel today. God says, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of how you treat Israel. I'm sick of how you treat the Jews. I know they're not holy. I know they rejected me. I know they're sinners. I know they don't do everything right. That's not what the argument's about. I made a promise to their father Abraham. And when I make a promise, I keep it. And, and everybody's now attacking my friend Abraham's kids. I don't like it. And I'm going to deal with it. For the cause of Zion, I will come to judge you. Its streams shall be turned into pitch. Again, down here in Edom, it's dusty, the brimstone. That's from the great heat of the battle of the Lord. Its land shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever from generation to generation. It shall lie waste. That is during the millennial kingdom. The earth's going to be restored, but there's going to be one area that's still going to be just smoldering. This area down there at Petra, he's going to deal with them so violently in the armies of the Antichrist, it's going to burn. It's going to be their kind of a smoldering pitch throughout the millennial kingdom. The rest of the earth will be revived and refreshed. But this one area, no one will pass through it forever and ever. But the pelican and the porcupine shall possess it, so wild animals. Also the owl and the raven shall dwell in it. He shall stretch out over it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. He shall cut its nobles to the kingdom, or call its nobles rather, to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all its princes shall be nothing. That is, that whole area is wiped out, so there's not even any nobles to call to the kingdom. And horns shall come up in its palaces. Thorns. Thorns. Sorry. That'd be odd, huh? Anyway, thorn, I'm very visual when I see these. Thorns shall come up in the palaces. Nettles and brambles in the fortresses, so all abandoned. It should be a habitation of jackals, a courtyard for ostriches. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the jackals. The wild goat shall bleat to its companion. Also the night creature shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. There the arrow snake shall make her nest and lay eggs and hatch and gather them under her shadow. There also the hawks will be gathered, every one with their mate. So just showing the destruction that's going to happen there to those that are gathering against the Jews because the Antichrist is going to put a large army to finally kill all the Jews just to kind of in, in God's face kind of thing. You love the Jews so much, I'm going to wipe them out. And God says, I'm coming to protect them. And it's going to be kaboom. And that place can be so kaboomed, it's going to be kaboomed the entire thousand years that we're there. So if you want to go to Petra, I, now's the time to visit. Because you're not going to be able to go to the Millennial Kingdom. And I did finish. I'm so glad. I know I flew through that last part, but I really wanted to finish this because this is so awesome. Look what he says these last couple of verses. Search from the book of the Lord and read. Not one of these shall fail. Not one shall lack her mate. For my mouth has commanded it, and his spirit 
has gathered them. Here's what he's saying. If it's in my word, it's going to happen. I don't know that I believe what you're saying, Mark. Who cares? Don't believe Mark. Search the book. Search the book and read. Guys, this is what we're teaching. It's not about us. It's not about my opinion or my viewpoints. I certainly have them. It's God's word that matters. I can't say that none of my opinions or viewpoints sneak in when I'm teaching. They probably do, and sometimes I don't even know it. But the reality is, it's God's word that matters. This is what matters. If somebody says to you, I can't believe you're saying that Jesus is the only way to heaven, your response should be, I'm not saying that. Oh, I thought you were. No, God said it. I didn't say it. And if I said it, it would have no weight. But Jesus said it in John 14, 6. Search the book and read. See if he said it. You find out. Don't believe me. Go find out. I can't believe you said that some of the things that are happening culturally in America, they are sinful. I didn't say it. God said it. Search the book and read. God will tell you. You get the point. Search the book. You've got it. We have his book. Search it and read. You'll know what his word says. He has cast a lot for them, and his hands have divided it among them with the measuring line, for they shall possess it forever. From generation to generation, they shall dwell in it. Oh, I wanted to finish 35. <sighs> Some reason I thought 34 was 35. It's not. <sighs> you know, every time I come to this point, 34 is still 34, and 35 is 35. It's the oddest thing. Anyway, read ahead. Read the next few chapters so you know where we're going next time. And in chapter 35, the highway of holiness, here's a fun hint. There's literally gonna be, when, when the earth is restored, now imagine, you can't even picture what Jerusalem's gonna be like because it's not that way now. There's gonna be a giant raising up of the land. His throne there. Everything, trees, glory, this beautiful, shining, sparkling river flowing through there. There's gonna be just, there's gonna be a highway that's gonna be working its way up to Jerusalem. And we're all going, when we go up for the feast, we're going to be walking on that highway. It's going to tell us next week. It's called the Highway of Holiness. And we're going to be singing praises to God and just visiting with each other and rejoicing. And as we get to it, we're going to see the glow of the kingdom and the glow of the Lord. And we're going to walk into, we're going to be singing and walking into the praises of the angels and the praises of all that are there. And the Lord, they're welcoming, welcoming us. And all the tables that are set with all the heavenly food for the feasting that we're going to be doing over the next week for the Feast of Tabernacles and all the rejoicing. That's what you're going to be walking on. Is that awesome or what? I can't wait. I'm like, well, let's, let's do this thing. Now, I know we have to get through some stuff. But guys, don't ever forget what the ultimate end is. If you're discouraged today about what you see going on in America and around the world, I am too. It's disappointing. We need to make a stand and speak truth in love. But at the same time, oh, man, does it get good after this. Hang in there. Hang in there. Let your little knuckles turn white. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the promises. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of your glorious kingdom, the highway of holiness that we'll be singing on and rejoicing and making our pilgrimage up to the new Jerusalem. What's it going to look like? Not the new one at the end, but the one you're going to bring with you or the one you're going to make when you come back. And just thinking of the forestation that'll be there and the beautiful streams. Maybe there'll be bridges over the river that's coming from Jerusalem. We'll see that beautiful sparkling water with beautiful fish jumping under it. Maybe they're going to sing. Who knows? We can't wait. I just can't wait. Lord, help us to stay focused on being about our Father's business while we're here. But let us not get so discouraged and downtrodden that we lose our vision of hope in the glory that awaits. Fill your precious flock tonight with your spirit and your joy and your hope. And Lord, we receive it by faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.